Hi, everybody, and welcome to the fourth module in our 10-part GI lecture series designed for those of you studying for USMLE Step 1 or Comlex Level 1. Today, we're going to be talking about the stomach. And like with most lectures, we're going to do anatomy and then physiology and then conditions. So starting with anatomy, I just wanted to talk about the stomach regions and some of the other anatomical landmarks. We'll start with the regions. So the cardia is the region of the stomach that's closest to the esophagus. It's located here. And a good mnemonic to remember that is, I remember cardia burn is heartburn. So, and we know that heartburn affects our esophagus. So it's easy way to remember that your cardia is the closest region. The next region is the fundus. That's the, the highest region of the stomach located here on the right. And I remember that by thinking fun in the sun. Our body is the largest middle portion of the stomach. So it comprises this entire area. And our pylorus is the region that's closest to the duodenum. So it's located here. And you can subdivide the pylorus into two sections. There's the pyloric antrum, which is the section closest to the stomach. And you have the pyloric canal, which is closest to the duodenum. And I remember the difference between the two. I always think of the A in antrum as the first letter of the alphabet. So it's going to be the first thing that food encounters between these two regions. And now talking quickly about sphincters and curvatures. The lower esophageal sphincter, which we discussed in great detail in the esophagus lecture, divides our stomach and esophagus. So it's located up here. Whereas the pyloric sphincter divides our stomach and our duodenum, which is located here. The stomach has two curvatures. We have a lesser curvature, which is located here. And the greater curvature is the larger of the two curves. So it's located all the way around here. Now I'd like to take some time to talk about blood supply. I think this is, this can be high yield. A lot of times test takers don't know how to test anatomy in a lot of different ways. So they tend to rely on some blood vessels, especially these that I'm about to go over. So we've talked about this before, but as a reminder, all of our four gut organs receive blood supply through the celiac trunk. And the celiac trunk, which I've kind of alluded to, but haven't discussed in great detail, the celiac trunk is comprised of three major vessels, okay? And let's talk about those right now. We have our left gastric artery, which I've highlighted in orange. We have our common hepatic artery, which I've highlighted, including all of its uh, some of its branches. And we also have the splenic artery, highlighted in purple. And as you can see, the combination of these three vessels are able to adequately supply many regions of the stomach. Now I want to take a step back and ascertain exactly which blood vessels are contributing to each region of the stomach. So for the cardia, remember cardia is the one, the region closest to our esophagus, that's gonna be supplied by the left gastric artery. The fundus, on the other hand, is gonna be supplied by the, uh, the short gastric arteries coming off of the splenic. So here's our splenic artery. And from that splenic artery, you can see these, these branches right here, the short gastrics, to supply the fundus. The lesser curvature is supplied by two different arteries. We have our left gastric, and we also can supply it through the common hepatic, the prop, and then that goes to the proper hepatic, and that'll lead to the right gastric artery. The greater curvature can also be supplied by two different arteries. First, starting with the splenic artery, the left gastroepiploic artery, sometimes called the left gastroomental artery. And it can also be supplied through the common hepatic and the gastroduodenal artery, leading into the right gastroepiploic artery. Now, why is this clinically relevant? Well, this is clinically relevant because the lesser and greater curvatures, at least most of the lesser and greater curvatures, are able to receive collateral circulation. So if one side goes bad, there's a reduced risk of ischemia because another blood vessel can just help out and provide some collateral flow so the tissue doesn't die. So let's talk about how that works. In the 
and this is this is basically what I just said is that there's dual supplies, and so there's less risk of ischemia. So for the lesser cur curvature, if we think about our left gastric coming into here, imagine that you have some sort of event causing obstruction at that X. Normally, we'd be worried about the, the region of tissue distal to this obstruction, but because there's collateral flow, this blood can come here and it can even bypass it and go a little bit further to help out. And so you're not gonna get as much ischemia in that region. And you can see the same thing if you have an obstruction in the, the blue in the right gastric artery, then the left gastric can help out. And the same thing goes for most of the greater curvature. Right, at least the more inferior portions of the greater curvature of the stomach, you can imagine that if there's a, uh, a mark here in the left gastroepiploic, then the right gastroepiploic can help out. And likewise, if the right gastroepiploic or the right gastroomental artery has some obstruction, then the left gastroomental can help out. So everything has dual blood supply, almost. I really want to talk about a couple test taking tips. So you need to know the anastomoses that I just discussed because they can ask something like, the left gastric artery is critically stenotic, but the lesser curvature is well perfused. Which artery helps to supply this region? So they're, they want you to realize that here's the left gastric and they really want you to understand it, common hepatic to proper hepatic to right gastric that helps out that region. And sometimes they'll test you which primary branch of the celiac trunk is helping it for which you'd answer common hepatic. But other times, if they don't specify, oftentimes they want you to know the specific artery, the closest artery. So in that case, you'd pick the right gastric artery because it's the one that's directly supplying that ischemic region. Another thing they like to test is the fact that the fundus is the most at risk for ischemia because there is not a lack of collateral blood circulation. As we've talked about, mo the lesser curvature is covered with the left gastric and the right gastric helping each other out. And the inferior portion of the stomach is covered by the right and left gastroomental or left or gastroepiploic arteries. But the the right up here, the top right or the top left region technically of the stomach, the fundus, has a little bit of problem with that. So if you imagine the splenic artery being obstructed, they might say, which region is most at risk. So let's draw our splenic artery. You can imagine if this is cut here, if we, we can still have collateral circulation that kind of supplies most of this region, but it will not supply this region. It can't make it all the way up to the short gastrics up there. And so the fundus will be most at risk. And some one, another tie-in I wanna mention that we've talked about before in the esophagus lecture is that you need to know a couple of the common arteries that are responsible for bleeding in certain conditions. So the left gastric artery has two conditions you need to be aware of. First, Mallory-Weiss syndrome can cause bleeding from the left gastric artery, and gastric ulcers also cause tend to cause bleeding when they do per, when they do bleed. It's from the left gastric. So if you imagine an ulcer right here, that can cause some bleeding. Another artery you have to be aware of is the gastroduodenal artery which is located here, merging into the right gastroepiploic. And this artery is dangerous because, because posterior duodenal ulcers can bleed and cause life-threatening hemorrhage. So if you imagine a posterior duodenal ulcer, that could also bleed. Now for the stomach, we do need to talk about several cell types. There's five cell types that are gonna be important for you to recognize. And I have some pretty useful mnemonics to help you. So here's the five cell types. Let's go in these in order. Our parieta cells are located in the body and the fundus. Uh, just for what it's worth, I don't think the locations of these cells are as important as the functionality. You will need to know the location on a histologic slide, which I'll go over later, but I just wanted to be comprehensive. So the parietal cells basically located in a, a significant portion of your stomach and their function is to secrete HCL and intrinsic factor. And my mnemonic for parietal cells is that they're very parite, like polite. And I say this because we're gonna, there's two reasons why I have this mnemonic. First off, they like to say hi, they're very polite. So they always say hi. And that reminds me that 
the two compounds that parietal cells secrete are HCL and intrinsic factor. And later, when we talk about histologic slides, we'll notice that they're the first glandular cell. They're in the upper glandular layer. So they're very, they're very polite because they always, they're the first gland to greet anything that's coming into the system. Let's talk about chief cells now. They're also located in the body and the fundus. And the chief cells function is to secrete pepsinogen and gastric lipase, which are both uh, helpful for enzymatic breakdown. And so I think of chief cells as our chomp cells because they break down stuff. And our mucus cells are pretty easy to understand. They're, they're located throughout the stomach. And as you'd expect, they would produce mucus and they also produce bicarb. So they basically counteract the acidic environment that our body tends to produce in our stomach. I don't have a mnemonic for that because that's pretty self-explanatory. Next, we have our G cells, which are located a little bit more distally in the pyloric antrum and then throughout the duodenum. And our G cells are responsible for secreting gastrin. And I remember our G cells are gas cells because of gastrin. And we'll find out that Gastrin is the gas pedal for our stomach. It can help us produce a lot of hydrogen ions and make it a more acidic environment. So that's why the G cells I consider are gas cells. The last cell I wanna talk about are D cells. They're also located pretty distal in the pyloric canal and throughout the duodenum. And these cells secrete somatostatin. And I always remember somatostatin as somatostopin because it turns off everything, okay? And so my D cells are decreased cells because they produce this, this hormone that basically shuts, shuts every other hormone down. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time on the histology in the stomach. This might be the longest histology section I have for you because they do test this. So as a reminder, I know you've seen this probably far too many times, but the GI tract has four layers. We have the lumen, the mucosa, the submucosa, a muscular layer, and the serosa, or adventitia. In this case, if we're talking about the stomach, it's a sliding organ, so it's going to be a serosa. And so remember that mucosa is also divided into three different layers. We have the surface epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. And in the case of the stomach, the surface epithelium is made of simple columnar epithelia with mucus cells. And so that's secreting our mucus and bicarb. And in the case of the stomach, the lamina propria is secreting a lot of the glands. So all those cells we just described are part of glands. So, and they have these cells in them. So our parietal cells are secreting our HCL and intrinsic factor. Our chief cells are producing our enzyme, you know, our, our enzyme that help break down foods. Our G cells are producing gastrin, and our D cells are producing somatostatin. So let's look at it from this perspective. This, we can only see the mucosa and submucosa, but we have our lumen, our mucosa, and our submucosa. And then if we subdivide that, we have our surface epithelium. Here's our lamina propria. And then we have our muscularis mucosa right here. And now looking into the surface epithelium with a really fine tooth comb, you can see simple columnar epithelium, so they would look like this. And our lamina propria, as we just talked about, this is the area of our cell, our, our stomach that has a lot of the glands. So it's all those glands that we've talked about all live in here, all these different cell types. And now if we talk about um, how these glands actually secrete their substances into the lumen of the stomach, we have these things called gastric pits. And these are indentations that allow these glands to secrete substances. So I'll draw some in. Because it's a cross-section at a weird angle, some of them don't go all the way through. But just keep in mind that all of these, at whatever angle they're going, they do reach from the lumen down through the lower glandular layer. So they, they, they span across the lamina propria. And different sections of the gastric pits have different cell types. And keep in mind, different sections of the stomach also have different cell types. So this is not a one size fits all thing, but it's a good idea to, to realize. So from top to bottom, let's talk about where these cells are in generally speaking. So at the very top in our surface epithelial layer, we usually have our mucus cells. That's our surface mucus cells and our mucus neck cells. In the upper glandular layer, we have our parietal cells. And then our lower glandular layer, we're gonna have our chief cells, our G cells and our D cells. 
So now what I wanna do is I wanna draw this gastric pit to the left here. And I wanna talk about every, every cell so you can see it in a visual form. I've subdivided the slide now into a surface epithelial layer on top, as you can see here. And if you noticed, I cut the lamina propria in half now. And I did that because I wanted to let you know that there's two different layers of that lamina propria. We have our upper glandular layer, which is located here. And you can kind of see it has a more of a pink hue to it. And then we have a lower glandular layer, which is located here, and it has more of a purple hue to it. So here's the six cell types that we're gonna go over. And we'll start in the surface epithelium and talk about the surface mucus cells and the mucus neck cells. These are pretty basic cells. They produce mucus and bicarb. Nothing to be surprised about with that one. The parietal cells produce, we already talked about this before, but they produce HCL and intrinsic factor. And here's where the mnemonic comes in handy. So just remember that parietal cells are very parite. They're very polite. They're the first gland to greet you. And notice how they're in the upper glandular layer. And they always say hi. And that's, that's to remember HCL and intrinsic factor. Moving down to the lower glandular layer, we have several cell types. We have chief cells, D cell, G cells, and D cells. And so as we talked about before, chief cells, those are our chomp cells that produce pepsinogen and gastric lipase. G cells turn on the gas, so they produce gastrin. And D cells produce somatostatin, which is, I, I like to refer to it as somatostopin because it decreases the secretion of other hormones. So now that we have a little bit of an idea of where these cells exist and a little bit of basic idea of what their function is, we're gonna spend a lot more time going over their physiology. So mucus cells, again, it's quite basic. They produce mucus and bicarb, which protects us against our, our acidic environment. And what we'll talk about later is that if you have deficient mucus production, you can get acute gastritis. And on the other hand, if you have too much mucus production, you can get a disease called Menetrier's disease. Moving on to parietal cells, because they, they do two different functions, we're going to have to go into each of these functions in pretty great detail here. So we've talked about this. If you, if you don't know this by now, I don't know what we're going to have to do. You'll, you'll learn it by the end of the lecture that parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. And here's my mnemonic again, just for your own reference. And the pathology we have to think about is pernicious anemia, chronic autoimmune gastritis. So let's talk about, first I'm gonna talk about their, how they secrete hydrochloric acid. So let's go over that mechanism. So here's a parietal cell. I'm gonna draw the bloodstream and the gastric lumen just to kind of give you a little bit of frame of reference here. Parietal cells secrete hydro, uh, hydrogen ions into the gastric lumen by using this hydrogen potassium ATPase. So for every hydrogen that goes into the lumen, it needs to reabsorb one potassium. Uh, I'm gonna spend this time talking about the alkaline tide because I think it's relevant. We can't just secrete hydrogen ions into the gastric lumen willy-nilly. We have to get that hydrogen from somewhere. And so I wanted to talk about how that works. The alkaline tide actually shows that your blood pH will increase when you use to, when you are producing so much gastric acid, and it's because of this mechanism right here. So, if you have carbon dioxide in water, you can use carbonic anhydrase, and you can convert that what was CO two in water. You can convert that to bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion, and so for that hydrogen ion can then leave into the lumen, but this bicarb, for every hydrogen ion that goes, this bicarb is gonna leave into the bloodstream. So your blood's gonna become more basic while your lumen of your uh, stomach is gonna become more acidic, and that's called the alkaline tide. So after you eat, if you measured your pH of your blood, it would actually be a little bit higher um, after eating. And for every bicarb that comes in, you can get chloride that comes into the cell and out as well. And so that's how you get HCL into your gastric lumen.
I've only described a very, very small percentage of how that works. So let's actually go through what activates this process and what stops the process. So here's our activators and here's our inhibitors. Let's start with the vagus nerve to talk about how the vagus nerve can activate all this. So let's first start talking about the vagus M3 pathway. So the vagus nerve can secrete acetylcholine and that acetylcholine can bind to an M3 receptor. This is pretty similar to what we were seeing in our oral cavity lecture. And that can, the M3 receptor can activate a GQ pathway, which activates a bunch of intracellular mechanisms. You have your IP3 DAG pathway, your protein kinase C and calcium, and all of that combined can finally activate this enzyme, the H plus, K plus ATPase, okay? So, if you give somebody atropine, which inhibits the M3 receptor, you would think that it would stop any gastric acid secretions. But as Morpheus might tell you, atropine doesn't stop the hydrogen potassium ATPase that well. The reason is that the vagus nerve actually has two pathways by which to activate this enzyme. So let's talk about the GRP pathway now. So instead of going down the acetylcholine pathway, the M3 pathway, the vagus nerve can activate, can release GRP. And GRP, gastrin-releasing peptide, as you might have expected, it can uh, activate G cells to secrete gastrin. We already know G cells are our gas cells. So they're going to secrete gastrin. And we know gastrin increases, uh, is kind of the go button, the on switch for hydrogen ion secretion. So what gastrin will do is it'll bind to the CCKB receptor and go through the same GQ pathway to activate um, the H plus K plus ATPase. So if we talk about atropine versus the vagotomy, so if you give somebody atropine, yeah, it'll shut down this pathway, but you can still get hydrogen ion secretion through this pathway. On the other hand, if you block the vagus nerve completely, like if you cut the vagus nerve in a vagotomy, well, you won't get either of these pathways. So a vagotomy would more effectively inhibit a hydrogen ion secretion. The last pathway I want to talk about is the histamine pathway. So gastrin, in addition to binding to the CCKB receptor and going through this pathway, uh, gastrin can also go through a different pathway where it activates ECL cells to produce histamine. And this histamine can go and bind to an H2 receptor, and that, that can start an intracellular cascade with a G sub S protein that'll activate cyclic AMP, and ultimately you'll, you'll get activation of the same enzyme. If we talk about inhibitors now, I'm gonna clear a little bit of the left side of the screen for us. What's gonna happen is that these inhibitors can bind to their own receptors which are G sub I coupled, and G sub I coupled proteins are known for uh, inhibiting cyclic AMP. So it'll bind to the cyclic AMP and inhibit that whole process. So you won't get any, you won't get as much, I should say, a hydrogen ion secretion. While we're here, I'd like to just briefly discuss the pharmacology of how some of these um, medications work to inhibit hydrogen ion secretion or inhibit GERD symptoms, like heartburn symptoms. We'll start with PPIs. So PPIs, their mechanism is they can directly inhibit this hydrogen potassium ATPase, and that's what makes them so effective. No matter which pathway you choose, the end result is that this enzyme gets inhibited. And we see PPIs used in several different modalities. We talked about it in GERD. We're gonna see it in gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, and it can also be used as part of H. pylori therapy. There's some notable side effects you should realize. When we are inhibiting this, we're not getting as much acid into our stomach, and sometimes that stomach acid can be useful to kill some bacteria for us. So you might get some infections. You can get C. diff. You can get something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which we talk about later in the small intestine lecture. You can also get pneumonias as well. So it's it's it can be that it can hurt you sometimes if you don't have as much acid there to protect you. Another thing that can happen is that you can get malabsorption because some compounds 
need some acid to either cleave a bond or they need it for to enhance absorption. And the last thing I just want you to realize is that PPIs are known for as a cause of acute interstitial nephritis. I got to be honest with you. I don't think I've seen PPIs tested uh, um, regarding AIN. It's usually um, usually diuretics, painkillers, penicillins I've seen. Oftentimes it's NSAID use though on a test question. I just wanted to remind you, I know we're not doing a kidney lecture, but as you can see, PPIs are one of the, the five common offenders that they like you to remember for step one as causes of acute interstitial nephritis. Let's move on to talk about histamine blockers or antihistamines. So these obviously, as their name suggests, they'll inhibit the H2 receptor here. Uh, some of the names that you might be familiar with are ranitidine, famotidine, cimetidine. And again, they're used for some of the same things. They're used less often because they're less efficacious. And it makes sense that they're less efficacious because the PPI could inhibit the, the enzyme that's causing this whole thing to happen. Whereas these guys can only stop one part of the pathway. You can still get hydrogen ion production through this pathway, even if your H2 receptor is blocked. Some side effects, they really like to test cimetidine side effects more than anything. Just know that it's a P450 inhibitor uh, and just know its associations with gynecomastia and impotence. You could know that it crosses the placenta, but that's a little lower yield. They usually test it in the context of gynecomastia or that it's a P50 inhibitor. So you have to watch out for those interactions. And last thing I wanted to talk about are antacids. How do they work? Is they bind free hydrogen ions in your lumen. So let's say you have some hydrogen ions in your lumen. You can get either aluminum hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide. And then these can dissociate into hydroxyl ions, and those can actually bind and neutralize the, the acid in the stomach to create water. And the side effects you have to know with these is that aluminum hydroxide causes constipation and magnesium hydroxide causes diarrhea. And a, a helpful mnemonic is that aluminum gives you minimum feces, so you get constipated, and magnesium gives you mega feces or diarrhea. Last thing I want to talk about before we move on to some things about intrinsic factor is this hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. This is highly tested. And this is a laboratory finding. What often they'll do is they'll just say somebody's vomiting or they won't even tell you about the patient. They'll just give you lab values and they'll make you realize that it's a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. And that should tell you that they might be vomiting severely. I've seen this in the context of like a young woman who comes in and they don't say anything about her. They just say she's really sick. She's like, you know, somnolent in the ED and they get labs and they show this pattern. And you can see that she's got dental caries already. And you have to think, oh, maybe she's got bulimia and you have to, you know, act accordingly to replenish her electrolytes. So how does this actually happen? The hypokalemia occurs because as you're losing a bunch of fluid through vomiting, your body has to try to retain fluid to keep your blood pressures up. So what will happen is your kidneys will try to preserve as much sodium as they can so that you still have a good, uh, that, that sodium can pull water in and you can keep some, some fluid within your bloodstream to maintain your blood pressures. The problem with that is for every sodium that you keep, your body's going to excrete potassium. So you're going to be hypokalemic. The hypochloremia makes a lot of sense because you're directly losing chloride in the lumen. And the metabolic alkalosis should make sense because if you remember from our discussion of the alkaline tide earlier, if you have to keep producing all this hydrogen, you're going to gain bicarb. And you're, and obviously, if you lose an acid in general by throwing it up, you're going to gain base, relatively speaking. Now let's talk about intrinsic factor and vitamin B12 absorption. So B12 absorption is a pretty complex pathway. So let's kind of go over, you need all of these things to be working in order to absorb B12. It's actually pretty hard to absorb B12. So you need adequate intake. We need to produce our binder. We need to produce intrinsic factor in our stomach. 
we need pancreatic proteases. We also need normal intestinal bacteria levels, a healthy terminal ileum, and adequate liver storage. So I'm going to go over all of that so we can understand what's going on and why we need each of those seven things in order to absorb B12. Well, the first thing is that B12 is consumed and it's bound to animal product when it's consumed, okay? Our binder gets produced in the oral cavity and all of these end up into the stomach. What's going to happen is the stomach will encounter this B12 animal protein complex and it will cleave this B12 in animal product. Now, if you don't have our binder, the B12 would just get degraded right away. But because our binder is also coming into the stomach, B12 will bind to our binder to protect it. While this is going on, intrinsic factor gets produced. And all of these, this B12, RB complex, and intrinsic factor all travel to the small intestine together. Okay. And remember, intrinsic factor at this point is just free flowing. It's not actually bound to the B12 yet. Next step is that we need to get this B12 and R binder disconnected. Our binder has done its job. It, it carried B12 from the stomach to the small intestine. And so now we need pancreatic proteases to come along and cleave this to give B12 a little bit of freedom. Once B12 is free like this, uh, intrinsic factor that's also free can now bind to B12. And these together can start making their way all the way through the small intestine. So they're gonna travel all the way through the small intestine and they're gonna reach the terminal ileum and there they're able to be reabsorbed at the terminal ileum. So we can bring them into the bloodstream this way. And from there we have, we can have up to a five year store, I think it is in our liver. So it's gonna to travel to the liver and it can get stored there. And so I'm gonna talk about each of these seven absorption requirements and we can talk about different conditions that may contribute to B12 deficiency. So first one's pretty obvious. If you don't have enough B12 intake, you, you might have a deficiency. And because B12 is, is bound to animal protein, those who are vegan and not taking supplements, they can, cause, they can end up getting the B12 deficiency over time if they're not supplementing. Our binder can also give you it. And so you can think of something like Sjogren's syndrome. I will say that Jury, you're not going to get tested on the R binder stuff. Um, and Sjogren's syndrome also has an association with pernicious anemia, which I'll talk about later. So there's a couple different reasons why Sjogren's might cause B12 deficiency. But I wanted to just let you know that technically speaking, there, if you have a salivary gland deficiency, there may be some association with B12 deficiency. Now here's what I'm talking about. So intrinsic factor, if you don't have intrinsic factor, you can get something called pernicious anemia and that can cause B12 deficiency. If you've had a gastrectomy, then you don't, you might not have enough varietal cells to produce intrinsic factor. That can also give you a deficiency. Obviously, if you have pancreatic insufficiency, so you don't have enough pro, uh, functional pancreas to produce the proteins to cleave B12 from our binder, in the small intestine, then that can cause B12 deficiency. If you have an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, sometimes what happens is that, remember how our B12 intrinsic factor complex was traveling together throughout the small intestine? Well, sometimes those bacteria will come in and they'll cleave that bond and they might even consume some of the vitamin B12. And so that's those are two ways that you, you will have a B12 deficiency because of too much uh, bacteria in that region. Uh, remember that the B12 is absorbed in that terminal ileum, so they do love to test that Crohn's disease, which has a propensity to affect the terminal ileum, uh, has an association with B12 deficiency. And they also like to test that this Diphylobothrium latum tapeworm is associated with B12 deficiency because it tends to live in that region as well. And the last thing to realize is that if you have liver cirrhosis, you might not actually be able to store as much B12 because you don't have functional liver. And so that is another reason to cause B12 deficiency. Now, how does somebody present if they have B12 deficiency? Well, they're gonna present most of the time on test questions, especially with some sort of neurologic symptoms, okay? You're gonna get, um, and they love this subacute combined degeneration, which I'll talk about right now. 
So if this is a close-up of a spinal section, we can talk about how B12 and subacute combined degeneration works. What it's gonna do is it's gonna cause damage to two regions. It's gonna cause damage to the, dors the dorsal columns and the lateral columns. Okay, so the dorsal columns are, is this region here, and they're responsible for vibration sense and proprioception. So you might have some sort of proprioceptive changes in the patient. And the lateral column, that is part of our, one of our um, outflow tracks of movement, motor, neurons. So you might actually have weakness. You could have spasticity or hyper or hyporeflexia, depending on whether it's an upper or motor lower motor neuron lesion. But this combination of decreased proprioception, if you can feel numbness and tingling, as well as a whole host of other neurosymptoms that should lead you into B12 deficiency as a, pot a potential cause. You can also get glossitis. I've talked about this in the oral cavity lecture where most of your iron deficiency and, and vitamin B deficiencies can cause glossitis. And then on laboratory findings, you're going to find a megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. So let's talk about what that actually means. So you can see megaloblastic macrocytic anemias in either B12 or folate deficiencies. Okay. And so a macrocytic anemia, let's start with that. Macrocytic anemia just means that the average uh, red blood cells bigger than, than normal. Okay, normally the red blood cell should be between an MCV of 80 to 100. If it's less than 80, it's a microcytic anemia. If it's between 80 and 100, it's a normocytic anemia. And then if it's over 100, you have a macrocytic anemia. Now from there, you can have a macrocytic anemia that's either megaloblastic or non-megaloblastic. And a megaloblastic anemia is where you have hypersegmented neutrophils. So you have these big, big neutrophils. Normally neutrophils have about three lobes. You can see that right here. But in megaloblastic anemia, you get six lobes. And as we'll discuss, this happens because there's defective DNA synthesis that causes these weirdly shaped um, multi-lobed neutrophils. Another lab finding you might find in, uh, in B12 deficiency is an elevated homocysteine and an elevated methylmalonic acid or MMA level. So let's talk quickly about these and I'm trying to keep it simple. There's a little bit more um, biochemistry involved than what I'm gonna show, but this is pretty much what you're gonna need for step one or level one. So this is homocysteine and this is methionine. And the only difference between these two compounds is this methyl group right here, the CH3. If you add a CH3 onto homocysteine, you have methionine, okay? Now, it'd be easy if you can just add the methyl group and call it a day. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. You need something to, to transfer a methyl group from homocysteine to methionine. So how that process works is that you'll have a folate. That folate can gain a methyl group through a couple of different reactions. That folate can then transfer its methyl group to vitamin B12. And then this B12 can help facilitate the transfer from homocysteine to methionine by giving up its uh, methyl group. If these are, if any of these, vitamin B12 or folate, are damaged, then you can get elevated homocysteine because there's nothing that can help the homocysteine to turn into methionine with that methyl transfer. And so a big point to note is that you can get homo elevated homocysteine in either of these vitamin B9, which is folate, or vitamin B12 deficiencies. Another thing I wanted to point out is that this process is also involved in the DNA synthesis pathway. And so if this pathway is damaged in any way, you'll get that megaloblastic anemia we saw earlier because you have defective DNA synthesis and your neutrophils don't fun don't form correctly, and you can form these really crazy like six or eight lobed neutrophils. What I want to talk about next is methylmalonic acid. So methylmalonyl CoA can actually be converted to succinyl CoA, and succinyl CoA is uh, a part of our citric acid cycle. And this process here is facilitated by vitamin B12, and like I said, succinyl CoA is part of the citric acid cycle, which let me show you 
you can see it right here. And our citric acid cycle is really important for us to generate, ultimately at the end of the day, it helps us to generate ATP. After you go after you go through the electron transport chain, but anything anything part of the citric acid cycle is a form of energy. So, when this process is defective, like let's say you have no B twelve, what's going to happen is that you'll have a lot of methylmalonyl CoA, which can turn into methylmalonic acid. So you can get elevated methylmalonic acid levels in vitamin B twelve deficiency. But an important note is that because folate has nothing to do with this pathway, if you have a folate deficiency, your methylmalonic acid level should still be normal. And then of course, in your laboratory findings, you'll likely find low serum vitamin B12, but they're not gonna give you that. They're not gonna be so easy on tests. They're gonna make you think about the symptoms and the homocysteine and methylmalonic acid levels or the megaloblastic macrocytic anemia to help guide your diagnosis as well. And here's a chart just to make sure I've reinforced all what the differences between folate and B12 deficiency are. So if we think about megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, they can both cause that. If we looked at the elevated homocysteine level, we saw that they both could cause that. Glossitis, because it's just any, any B vitamin or iron deficiency can cause glossitis. Now, some of the things that are exclusive to B12, though, the neurologic symptoms, that whole subacute combined degeneration, that's just for vitamin B12. Folate's actually normal in that spot. Okay, folate does not cause neurological symptoms like that. And then the elevated methylmalonic acid, again, because B12 is the only thing involved in that specific uh, transformation from methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA, you're not going to see any problems. If you have a folate deficiency, you won't see elevated MMA levels. The last thing about B12 that I want to talk about is something called the Schilling test. It's pretty low yield now. You'll never see this in real life, but sometimes they test this. I think it's I think even on tests it's falling out of favor, but I think it's kind of a cool way to look at B12 deficiency. So how it works is the Schilling test has a couple stages, okay? And I've tried to make this as simple as possible. So stage one of the Schilling's test is just determining is there an actual deficiency, right? So how this works is that you're gonna give somebody a radioactive B12 by mouth, okay? While you're doing that, you're gonna give them an injection of B12. The reason you give them an injection of B12 is you want to saturate all of their B12 stores that are in their body temporarily, okay? And by doing that, you can determine if the radioactive B12 gets absorbed into the bloodstream and peed out later. So what happens is that the B12 injections are given to ensure that the body stores are filled. And then later on, you're gonna collect urine radioactive B12 levels, okay? And if you're able to absorb the B12, you'll detect some of that B12 in the urine. And if you can't absorb the B12, you won't detect the radioactive B12 in the urine. So here's our picture. Imagine we take we intake radioactive B12 and we've already been injected with B12. So our body stores are completely saturated. And what that means is that if any of this radioactive B12 enters our bloodstream, it's not gonna be stored anywhere because we're already saturated. And instead it's just gonna be excreted in the urine. And so our kidneys will do their job and we can identify B12, radioactive B12 in the urine. And on the other hand, if we don't absorb any radioactive B12, then of course we're not gonna find any of the urine. So this is the first step of the Schilling's test. We just wanna see, is there a problem, right? And so if we don't detect any radioactive B12 or we detect lower levels than we want of radioactive B12 in the urine, now we know there is a B12 deficiency, right? Next step would be to find out what's causing that deficiency. As you can see from this table, there's so many different things that can cause B12 deficiency. So it'd be hard to pinpoint exactly what's causing it. You could have intrinsic factor problems, pancreatic proteases, SIBO. So there's a lot of different things that can happen. And so the next stage of the Schilling test is to try to determine what's causing the B12 deficiency. So oftentimes the first thing that they test is they wanna see if you have intrinsic factor deficiency. 
So we'll do the exact same thing. We'll give you a radioactive oral B12. We'll give you a B12 injection to make sure everything's saturated. And this time we're also gonna give you intrinsic factor by mouth as well, to see if that'll help um, help with the digestion, I mean, the absorption of B12. And then you do the exact same thing where you measure the radioactive B12 levels in the urine. And if you detect anything in the urine, that means that it was able to be absorbed now with the addition of intrinsic factor. And so if that was the case, then you'd know, okay, intrinsic factor deficiency was my problem in the first place. So again, this time we have B12 and intrinsic factor. And if it's able to be absorbed this time, and we can detect that B12 in the urine, we've identified that the person's problem here is pernicious anemia. It's an intrinsic factor deficiency. But let's just say, for example, that it's all normal. Again, that tells us, okay, intrinsic factor, I mean, not normal. Let's just say that there was no um, B12 detected in the urine again. What that tells us is that even adding intrinsic factor didn't solve the problem. So we're gonna have to find out another thing that might be causing this problem. So you think instead of intrinsic factor, you can give them pancreatic proteases. Maybe they have a pancreatic insufficiency and that's why they can't digest B12. Maybe they have um, such a strong, uh, they might have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and that all the bacteria in the small intestine may be preventing the absorption. So giving them antibiotics and then trying this again might be a good uh, way to go about it. So that's what the Schilling test is all about. Now we're gonna move on. That was the longest section in physiology, I promise. Uh, chief cells are pretty straightforward. They're in the lower glandular layer and they get secreted through these gastric pits. And they are, remember there are chomp cells. So they're gonna secrete pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is a zymogen, which can be cleaved into pepsin by the, in the presence of acid. And then that pepsin can go and try to digest proteins. We also have gastric lipase here that can help break down fats. But just as a reminder, the pancreatic lipase, which we'll talk about in the pancreas section, is more important for breaking down fats. And again, the mnemonic is chomp cells, as you know. Now let's talk about our G cells. So these G cells secrete gastrin, and they provide the gas for the stomach. And why we say they provide the gas is because they really do increase the functionality of our stomach. They can increase the hydrogen ion secretion they can increase our gastric motility, and they can increase the gastric mucosa growth. We've already seen how gastrin increases hydrogen ion secretion earlier. When we're talking about here, we can see that our G cells and gastrin right here, they can help perpetuate all this. I'm gonna go back. They can, they can help through either of these pathways, they can help increase hydrogen ion secretion in the long run. And so how is gastrin regulated? You don't want this gastrin to just be going out of uh, off the charts here because then you'll have a problem of too much hydrogen ion secretion. And the, the reverse might be true too. You need, you need a nice balance. So how it works is that you can have decreased release in acidic environments, which makes sense. If it's already acidic, you don't need gastrin to produce more acid. And then you increase the release in basic environments. So all this seems very, um, it makes sense from a homeostasis perspective. Now, what causes the basic environment? Well, when you eat food, that acidic stomach kind of gets neutralized by all your food products. So in the setting of once you eat food, it's good to have more gastrin release. That's a physiologic adaptation. If your vagus nerve gets stimulated, that can also uh, increase gastrin release. You can have, which we've already seen, the vagal nerve, um, through the GRP pathway. If you have PPIs or any antacids that prevents the acid from being secreted, that'll give you a more basic environment. So gastrin will start working harder. And then we'll talk about this later in chronic gastritis. If your parietal cells are dying and you don't have anything producing the hydrogen ions, then you're going to get G cell hyperplasia and excessive gastrin release. And pathologies to look out for think about uh, something called a gastrinoma, which is a gastrin secreting tumor that's gonna cause uh, something called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which we'll talk about later. The last cell type I wanna go over are D cells. And D cells, 
they are, are decreased cells and they produce somatostatin. So somatostatin is, a, is what I've been referring to as somatostopin. This decreases everything, decreases our gastric acid secretion, pepsinogen secretion, decreases our pancreatic and small intestinal fluid secretions, decreases glucagon, decreases insulin, decreases our gallbladder contraction. It turns everything off, okay? And so, and again, we've already seen somatostatin work its magic when we were looking at our inhibitors here. You could see somatostatin was one of those inhibitors that can ultimately decrease hydrogen ion secretion through this GI uh, coupled pathway. And some pathologies to look out for, all you have to know is that there's something called a somatostatinoma, which is a pancreatic islet cell tumor. Uh, this is from our pancreas lecture where I go into all the islet cell tumors. And I just wanted to point out that if you look at the symptoms, all the symptoms are completely related to having uh, turned off the hormones themselves, right? So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, we've done enough anatomy and physiology for this lecture. I'm sorry about that. It takes a while to talk about the stomach sometimes. Let's go into the conditions in a little bit more detail. And I've subdivided the conditions. I think that people get confused about the difference between acute gastritis, chronic gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, because they're they're pretty similar in some ways, but and they're notably different in others. So I'm actually going to take this framework as we go along, and I hope I hope things will make sense. Okay. So when we talk first about acute and acute gastritis and menetrier disease, I want you to think about it as a problem of um, imbalance. Okay. This is from one of our anatomy sections on the gastric pits. And you remember that our mucus neck cells and our surface mucus cells can produce mucus and bicarb, okay? That's gonna be important because that's gonna be one of the biggest defenses to neutralizing some of the acid that's produced in our uh, stomach. So if we have our gastric pit here, that's gonna be producing acid and we have to find a way to neutralize that sometimes. Otherwise that acid can eat away through our, our own uh, cells. And so we have a few defenses against that. We have our mucus and bicarb that I was just talking about. We also have, uh, if you have a constant blood supply, that helps because you can actually neutralize the acid by washing it away within the blood or neutralizing it with products from the blood. And uh, certain prostaglandins can also help to neutralize the acid, okay? So when you think about acute gastritis and menetria disease, I just want you to think about that balance. On one side of the scale, we have our acid, and on the other side, we have all these defenses. And if the side tips to where you have too much acid and not enough defense, you're gonna get acute gastritis. And you can remember that by more acid equals acute gastritis. So the AC is gonna help you remember. On the other hand, if you have this set up where you have too little acid and too much mucus, you can get something called menetrier disease. And again, the M and mucus can remind you of menetrier disease. I'm gonna start with menetrier disease because I think it's a little easier to talk about. So what happens in menetrier disease is that your surface mucus and mucus neck cell get really, really big. They just start overproducing stuff. And because their job is to produce mucus and bicarb, they're obviously going to produce excess mucus. What this will do is it'll actually cause your parietal cells to die and you'll start losing protein. So let's go over each of those things and why that happens. So the first thing is you get hyperplasia of all of our mucus neck cells and our surface mucus cells. And obviously these produce mucus. So if they're bigger and they're more active, they're going to produce more mucus. And that's not too surprising. You can get parietal cell atrophy because especially these surface, I mean, these mucus neck cells, they can grow so big that they actually start pushing against or blocking the exit pathways for some of these parietal cells. So you can actually start killing some of the parietal cells in the process. And you get protein loss because remember that a lot of times proteins and water like to stick together. So if you're, if you're throwing out all this mucus, a lot of the proteins will get either trapped in that mucus and then they can't get absorbed because it's just a uh, thick mucus layer. And so you'll actually lose protein over time. 
And so from this, you can get anorexia or weight loss because you can't absorb anything. You're throwing out all this mucus and it's preventing the adequate digestion of certain compounds. You can get vomiting and epigastric pain from all the mucus production. You can get edema and ascites. That occurs because you're losing so much protein. So normally protein can help you, like albumin, for example, that can help you keep your water within your intravascular space. You have a little bit of oncotic pressure bringing the water back into the space. The problem is if you just have very little protein compared to all this water, there's nothing that's actually helping the water gravitate and stay within the intravascular compartment. And so you're gonna get water that leaks out, which will form edema or ascites. And on imaging studies, it's important to know that there's a characteristic stomach gyri that you'll see. And that's because the mucus, mucosal cells have just grown overgrown and it looks like a brain. So here you can see on the left, it's just a normal stomach. It's very rounded, everything's fine. And on the right, you can see it does kind of look like a mini brain inside your abdomen right here. And that's classic for many trace disease. So we've talked about what happens when we have too much mucus, but now let's talk about the other side of the coin. Acute gastritis, where you have excessive acid production and not enough of these defensive mechanisms. So acute gastritis is an imbalance in acid secretion, which will ultimately cause mucosal st stomach damage. There's a few causes, and we'll go over each of these individually. You can get NSAID use, alcohol use, burns, increased intracranial pressure, shock and chemotherapy. These are uh, some of the more common causes of acute gastritis. So let's go over each of these in detail. We'll start with NSAID use. So uh, kind of going back to a little bit of biochem, what's gonna happen in pharmacology, uh, what's gonna happen is that we have phospholipids. They can actually uh, be converted into arachidonic acid through an enzyme called phospholipase A2. From there, arachidonic acid, can be converted into prostaglandins like PGE2. That's done through COX-1. Again, that's an enzyme. And this PGE2, this type of prostaglandin, can actually protect our gastric mucosa. So it's one of the it's one of the defense mechanisms for acid secretion. The problem with persistent NSAID use is that NSAIDs are COX inhibitors. They can block COX-1. And by blocking this enzyme, you won't get any of your healthy, your helpful prostaglandins and you won't have the gastric protection. So you'll ultimately have too much acid and that'll cause acute gastritis. Alcohol use is pretty straightforward. Alcohol can directly damage your uh, mucosal cells through direct contact. So alcohol can irritate these. We know you need your mucus cells for to produce mucus and bicarb. So if you don't have those, you get gastritis. Uh, curling ulcers, or these are caused by severe burns. And so what happens here is that you have a severe burn. That burn, if you've ever seen somebody in a burn unit, they're losing a lot of fluids through that burn. Very easy to lose fluids. Our skin is some of our most important protective barriers in our body. So they'll become hypovolemic and they won't have a good blood supply anymore to our stomach. They kind of have to shunt it to more important organs. And because of that decreased blood supply, you'll get curling ulcers and acute gastritis. And a mnemonic that you'll commonly see in some of the review resources is that you can get burned by a curling iron. To remember, curling ulcers are associated with burns. Uh, increased ICP can cause something called Cushing ulcers. And so how this works is that increased intracranial pressure will overstimulate our vagus nerve. And remember our vagus nerve was important. It had two different pathways. It had the M3 pathway and the GRP pathway to ultimately increase hydrogen ion secretion through that hydrogen potassium ATPase. So if you're overstimulating that vagus nerve, you can get a ton of acid production and you'll get acid hypersecretion and acute gastritis. And a mnemonic you'll see, I think First Aid has it and a few others, is always cushion your brain to remind you Cushing ulcers are associated with ICP or increased ICP. And here we go. Here's a Cushing ulcer. If you imagine your vagus nerve gets big, all these pathways can get huge. And 
uh, in shock, you're going to have a low blood pressure. So that makes sense that you don't have good blood supply. And so that'll cause gastritis. And that's why most, if you've ever been to the ICU, you'll notice a lot of people in the ICU are placed on a PPI and it's to protect these people from developing a lot of these stress ulcers. And then chemotherapy should make sense. It kills any rapidly dividing cell, including some of your mucosal cells. So that can cause gastritis as well. Okay, let's move on to chronic gastritis and pernicious anemia. So chronic gastritis is not due to acid production, okay? When you think of gastritis, it makes sense, but I want you to think about it from a perspective of repeated inflammation or, or injury. And so here's how I like to differentiate acute gastritis, chronic gastritis, and peptic ulcer disease in my head. It's not 100% true. It's more of like a, I don't know, like a teleological explanation, but this helps me categorize them very well so I don't get confused. And so some similarities is that they all involve some sort of inflammation or damage to your gastric mucosa. They all have similar presentations. They're all treated with PPIs as, uh, in some cases. And H. pylori or NSAIDs can cause problems in a couple of the conditions. You can get cancer in a couple of these conditions. So it's hard to differentiate sometimes. I remember it like this. My acute gastritis is my, I just think of acute gastritis is an acid problem. So I just think it has to be due to one of those six causes that we talked about before. I, and it has to be some imbalance in these, these mechanisms. And I like to think about it in terms of how deep it goes. So I, I think about it, the acute gastritis, I think about it in the as a surface epithelium problem because that's where my mucus defenses are anyways. I, I just think about it like that. Again, that's not necessarily true. This could obviously still cause ulcers if the damage gets deep enough, but I want you to remember it like this. Acute gastritis affects the surface epithelium. That'll help you remember that it's an acid problem. It's a mucus problem. Chronic gastritis gets a little deeper, okay? So it's, it's affecting our upper glandular layer. And do you remember what's in our upper glandular layer? Our parietal cells, right? And so this helps me remember that chronic gastritis has to do with problems with my um, parietal cells. And we'll see that in a little bit and what that looks like. And peptic ulcer disease, I think of the D and PUD as PU deep. It's very deep, it goes through everything and it can cause a lot of problems. If it's going through everything, you can call you can reach the blood vessels and cause bleeding. If you reach, if you go through everything, you can cause a perforation. So that's kind of what I remember. PUD is deep. Okay, I'll go over these. This is just kind of a, a tangent that I like to go on because I think it's a good way to structure these three diseases. Okay, so chronic gastritis. It's chronic inflammation of the gastric mucosa. You can have autoimmune gastritis or chronic H. pylori infection can cause gast chronic gastritis, okay? So let's talk about autoimmune gastritis. It's going to be damage to your parietal cells, and it's usually autoimmune. I mean, it is autoimmune. Um, and that's kind of why I took that framework a couple slides ago, where it, the chronic gastritis affects my upper glandular layer, because it reminds me that what's really happening in the chronic autoimmune form is that my parietal cells are dying. So right here, if we go back, you can see if white blood cells come in and they start killing off our parietal cells, we're gonna have a problem. And all the presentation of chronic autoimmune gastritis is really simple if you think about it, because we know parietal cells do two things. They, per, they secrete HCO and they secrete intrinsic factor. So let's talk about what happens when we don't have enough of these. Well. For HCL, if you don't have enough of these, you'll get achlorhydria, you'll get increased stomach pH, and you'll get G-cell hyperplasia. Okay, so let's talk about what each of these three things mean real quick, just to make sure we all understand it. Achlorhydria is just the absence of HCL in your gastric secretions. It's, it's pretty straightforward. If you don't have a parietal cell in the first place, you can't produce any of these ions and secrete them into the lumen. So you'll get a chlorhydria. Now, increased stomach pH should also make sense. If you're not producing an acid in your lumen, your pH is going to go up. It's going to become more basic. And now the third one, this G-cell hyperplasia, 
again, this should make sense. If we go back to our gastrin regulation slide in our physiology section, we talked about how when the lumen of the stomach gets basic, you're going to increase your release of gastrin, right? We even mentioned that one of the conditions by which your um, stomach becomes more basic is chronic gastritis, which is what we're talking about right now. So if we have chronic gastritis, our pH is increasing, what's going to happen is that a feedback is going to cause our G cells to get really strong and they're going to overproduce gastrin. And so you'll get elevated gastrin and your G cells will get become hyper, uh, there's going to be G cell hyperplasia in the process. Now let's talk about the loss of intrinsic factor. When you lose intrinsic factor, you develop something called pernicious anemia, which I've alluded to in the B12 deficiency portion of this lecture, but I haven't talked about directly. So pernicious anemia, just why it was named that in the first place, um, pernicious actually means harmful, causing great ruin and fatal. And the reason it was named this is because this used to be incurable, which is crazy to think about. A uh, vitamin deficiency used to be incurable. So what happens here is that the parietal cells are destroyed. Because of that, you lose all your intrinsic factor. And without intrinsic factor, you're gonna develop a B12 deficiency. And so here was our B12 absorption slide earlier. I'm just gonna show you that intrinsic factor was one of the requirements for appropriate B12 absorption. And then on our, the right side, I'm gonna show you all the different mechanisms by which intrinsic factors needed. So we have our intrinsic factors produced, and then ultimately intrinsic factor will bind to B12 somewhere in the small intestine, and it's gonna travel with B12, and then it'll get absorbed, and that can go to the liver. Let me go back for a second. If we don't have intrinsic factor, B12 cannot get into your liver, I mean, into your bloodstream. So you'll develop a B12 deficiency. And that's kind of what, ha that is what happens in, in pernicious anemia. And so this can be caused by a few different things. Right now we're talking about chronic autoimmune gastritis. If you don't have parietal cells, then you don't have intrinsic factor. Another thing that can cause this is uh, post gastrectomy. So if you have part of your stomach uh, or a lot of your stomach removed, you'll take some of the parietal cells with it and you might not have sufficient intrinsic factor to produce, um, I mean, to absorb enough B12 in the future. And with treatment, you have to give intramuscular B12 injections. It's important to realize that you can give as much oral B12 as you want, but it's not gonna be adequately absorbed if you don't have intrinsic factor. In actual practice, you can like overload somebody with oral B12 and sometimes you get uh, an improvement because some people have like a relative intrinsic factor deficiency, but I want you to think about pernicious anemia as just a absolute zero intrinsic factor, zero chance of resolve re any sort of resolution with oral B12. Because on tests, they'll make you pick IM B12 injections as the correct answer here. So we talked about some of the findings in chronic autoimmune gastritis. What I wanna talk about are some complications and how we actually diagnose this. So a complication we can think about is mucosal atrophy. And what's happening is that we have so much damage and chronic inflammation here that you can actually get an intestinal metaplasia here. Because we have autoimmune damage to our parietal cells and, and that whole layer, you can get intestinal metaplasia. And as we saw from Barrett's esophagus, and we'll see in a couple other units, is that metaplasia is a precursor to dysplasia and ultimately cancer. And so chronic autoimmune gastritis is a risk factor for gastric cancer. And you can see if our upper glandular layer is just getting damaged by our own immune system, that can one day lead to some cancer. Okay, and now how do we diagnose this? Well, back in the day, we couldn't diagnose it. I mean, I guess maybe we could have used like a Schilling's test, right? We could have used a Schilling's test somehow and determined whether intrinsic factor was deficient, but we have better tests nowadays. We can actually just test the blood for different antibodies. We can test them against the parietal cell uh, H plus, K plus, ATPase, and we can also, there's antibodies against intrinsic factor directly. And then if you do a tissue biopsy, 
you're going to find parietal cell atrophy, which makes total sense because our own immune system is killing them all. Let's talk about the other source of chronic gastritis, and that's chronic H. pylori infection. And so if you have H. pylori colonization, it can, that can also cause inflammation of your mucosa, but it doesn't invade. It has a couple of sneaky mechanisms to survive in that acidic environment that you have in your stomach. The first thing it does is it produces urease. And what urease does is it, it, it converts ammonia into bicarb, I mean, into CO2, which can, um, excuse me, it converts urea into ammonia and CO2, which creates a basic environment because ammonia is a base. So how does that, and then uh, the CAG-A gene is an oncogene that disrupts our normal epithelial function and increases the risk of gastric cancer developing. And then proteases are pretty simple. They just weaken the gastric mucosa by digesting protein, proteins. So let's look at each of these three virulence factors. So urease, what it can do is it can convert urea into ammonia and CO2. And once you have ammonia, that ammonia can bind to the hydrogen ions and create ammonium. So you've neutralized the acid with a base. The CAG-A oncogene can ultimately cause cancer development. So it can come in here and form a cancer. And then proteases just weaken the gastric mucosa. So for chronic H. pylori gastritis, how is this presenting? Usually it's asymptomatic, but you could have people who have epigastric pain, um, some of the complications are chronic gastritis that we're talking about right now. You can also develop ulcers. So you can get either gastric or duodenal ulcers. And we talk about peptic ulcer disease in a little bit. And we'll find out that H. pylori is a big risk factor for that as well. So here's our H. pylori. You can get chronic gastritis. And then if it keeps going deeper, I like to think about, you can get gastric and duodenal ulcers. You can also get cancer. We talked about that CAG-A oncogene. And then anything that causes chronic inflammation can do the same thing that we talked about in chronic autoimmune gastritis, where you go from, you know, you, you have normal cells and then you have intestinal metaplasia and then dysplasia and ultimately adenocarcinoma. So the same thing can happen here with the chronic inflammation. The last thing, which is pretty rare, and I see it in all the tests, textbooks, and I'm waiting for a question on it. I haven't had a question on this yet. Um, you can get a malt lymphoma. And so that's increased lymphoid tissue recruitment to the area. And so, and that'll increase your risk of maltoma. So what happens here? What happens here is that all this inflammation is going to recruit uh, lymphoid tissues to the site. So you're going to get different lymphoid tissues activated to help out with the inflammation. The problem is that sometimes these this can actually overactivate and you can precipitate your own lymphoma from it. And how do you treat H. pylori? So there's two different therapies and you need to know these therapies cold. There's the antibiotic triple therapy, which is a PPI, clarithromycin and amoxicillin. And you can also use quadruple therapy, which is falling more in favor now, even for those people who are not allergic. And that's a PPI plus bismuth plus metronidazole and a tetracycline. So now let's move on to peptic ulcer disease and zollinger ellison syndrome. So peptic ulcer disease, the mechanism is decreased mucosal protection causing injury throughout the entire mucosa. You can have gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers. And I'm gonna create a chart now to talk about the differences between the two. So gastric ulcers are commonly caused by H. pylori, but they can also be caused by NSAIDs and bile reflux. Whereas duodenal ulcers, again, mostly caused by H. pylori, but a small percentage of them can be related to Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Gastric ulcers have a classic pain pattern where they, people have epigastric pain that worsens with meals. And duodenal ulcers have some, the opposite, where they have epigastric pain that improves with meals. And so let's talk about why this is. Well, if this is your ulcer, like a gastric ulcer, and you have a normal amount of hydrogen ions, uh, during meals, your body's going to produce more hydrogen ions, and that can cause inflammation to that ulcer, irritation, and pain. 
duodenal ulcers, on the other hand, um, you can still have gastric acid secretion, but once it reaches the duodenum, you have a lot of bicarb being produced in your duodenum that can help neutralize that acid. And that bicarb is only going to come into play once you've eaten and the hormones have secreted bicarb for you. A cancer risk, it's important to realize which of these are more dangerous. So gastric ulcers are have a high risk of cancer. So you do have to biopsy them. Whereas duodenal ulcers are rarely malignant. And so benign, I don't know if they'll show you a picture, but it's good to know. Benign ulcers just look like a very well circumscribed hole, like a hole punch in your tissue. So it can look something like that, let's just say. Whereas a malignant uh gastric ulcer will look very, very bad. It'll look, it'll be heaped up margins, larger, poorly defined borders. Let's talk about complications of each of these ulcers. So the first complication you have to consider is that either of these ulcers can cause an obstruction. And du with duodenal ulcers specifically, you can actually get pancreatitis. So if you think about a pancreas, and we'll talk a lot about how the pancreas works in our pancreas lecture, you have these pancreatic enzymes that get released into the duct, and these can go into the duodenum. Now, if you have an ulcer blocking off any part of that, then you might have a blockage and your enzymes will get stuck inside your pancreatic duct, and that can actually cause pancreatitis. It's important to realize that both of these ulcers have uh, a risk of bleeding. So gastric ulcers tend to live on the lesser curvature and they bleed from the left gastric artery, whereas duodenal ulcers, uh, especially posterior duodenal ulcers, they tend to bleed from the GDA, the gastroduodenal artery. So if here's our presentation, if you have a bleeding ulcer, it can uh, present in a number of ways. It could be an acute life-threatening bleed. Somebody could be coming in with signs of shock. They could have thrown up blood or they could be just bleeding very bad, a bright red blood per rectum, like hematochesia. Or you can just have a slower bleed, like a more asymptomatic GI bleed. So gastric ulcers, it's located on the lesser uh, curvature and the bleeding artery you need to know is the left gastric. This is the same thing we showed earlier today where you can have a, a bleed here, whereas posterior duodenal ulcers, they can bleed from the gastroduodenal artery so you can have a bleed in this area. The last thing you need to realize is that gastric ulcers are associated with malignancy, which we've talked about a lot late, uh, recently. And anterior duodenal ulcers have this risk of perforation and they love to test this. So somebody who has anterior duodenal ulcer perforation, they're gonna have severe epigastric abdominal pain. They're going to have rebound tenderness because now air and con bowel contents can get directly into their cavity, the peritoneal cavity. And they're going to have shoulder pain referred from the diaphragm. On imaging, you're going to see something called pneumoperitoneum. So I'm going to talk about each of these things now. So pneumoperitoneum means there's air in the peritoneal cavity. And because air will travel upward, you're going to see this region right here where an air pocket gets trapped. And that's directly visible in x-ray. You should not see this. If you see this in somebody, that's that's pathognotic for pneumoperitoneum. You're also going to realize they're going to have rebound tenderness from this pain, and they're going to have shoulder pain. And the shoulder pain is because this air is pushing against this diaphragm right here. And this diaphragm can have referred pain that goes all the way to the, sho uh, to the shoulder and you'll notice pain there. Next thing I wanna talk about, I talk about this as well in the pancreas section, it's the same lecture I use there, is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. This is a pancreatic islet cell tumor that secretes excessive gastrin. So we know gastrin is gonna produce, uh, gastrin is important for hydrogen ion secretion. So you're gonna get acid hy hypersecretion and that'll lead to recurrent ulcers in the distal duodenum or jejunum. And that's pretty rare if you think about it because we have bicarb in our, du our duodenum that should neutralize the acid, but there's just so much acid coming here that you can get uh, damage to 
parts that would otherwise be neutralized by them. So remember that gastric ulcers are normally caused by H. pylori or NSAIDs, but, and you have to biopsy them because they could be malignant. Uh, proximal duodenal ulcers usually caused by H. pylori, like over 95%. But now if you're looking at distal duodenal ulcers, you have to think about Zollinger Ellison. And so how this works, if we have a gastrinoma right here, hypersecreting gastrin, that'll activate our parietal cells to produce a ton of hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions can make it all the way to the distal duodenum or proximal jejunum and create these ulcers in, in regions that would otherwise be spared. It presents like any other duodenal ulcer that's going to be abdominal pain that improves with meals. So if you have a ton of acid and you have a ton of acid here, um, that's going to, that would injure the ulcers in general. But remember during times of feeding, you do have some bicarb that can help neutralize a lot of that acid, and that'll prevent most of the irritation to those ulcers. Um, one of the ways to diagnose this is the secretin stimulation test. So secretin normally uh, suppresses gastrin release, but gastrinomas don't care about secretin. They just keep doing their thing regardless. So how this works is that normally we have S cells in the duodenum that'll secrete, uh, produce secretin. They'll act in the pancreas and that's how we get our bicarb. It also helps us decrease our gastric acid secretion. So it's another way to help out in the battle be, uh, neutralizing some acid production. But the problem is that gastronomas, if we have a gastronoma here, producing gastrin and all this hydrogen ions, if you use secretin and try to inhibit gastrin release, it's not gonna work. So you just have the steady supply of uh, hydrogen ions. And I just want to point out, because it's a pancreatic islet cell tumor, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is one of those tumors that's associated with MEN1 syndromes, okay? I talk about this in detail in the pancreas lecture. I just want you to know that our MEN1 syndromes are our three Ps. And right here, our pancreatic islet cell tumors include gastrinomas, Here's all five of our pancreatic islet cell tumors, and we talk about these in the pancreas lecture. Just wanted to point out that this is what we talk about there. Same thing as Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is a gastrinoma. Now let's move on to gastric adenocarcinoma. So this is a malignant conversion of gastric mucosa. It's gonna present with early satiety. You're not gonna be as hungry if you have a tumor that's take, occupying a lot of the, the lumen of your stomach. You can get weight loss as you can with any cancer. You're gonna have abdominal pain and you can get anemia because the cancer can bleed. You can have an iron deficiency anemia. There's two subtypes we need to know about. There's an intestinal subtype and a diffuse subtype. So let's talk about each of these really quick. The mechanism by which the intestinal subtype forms is the mechanism we've already been talking about where you have metaplasia that turns into dysplasia and turns into adenocarcinoma. So we've already seen this, for example, with chronic autoimmune gastritis, we've seen this mechanism in place. In diffuse, uh, in diffuse gastric adenocarcinoma, you don't have this pathway. You actually just have an e here in mutation that forms diffuse uh, adenocarcinoma. So let's talk about risk factors. We know some of them over here. It's gonna be things that cause chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation can cause metaplasia or cause a dysplasia and lead to this pathway. So we've talked about chronic gastritis as a precipitating factor. You can also have smoked foods can cause chronic irritation, smoking. And if you're blood type A, which is interesting, that's actually a risk factor for this as well. For diffuse gastric adenocarcinoma, it's not related to any of these risk factors. It's just a spontaneous e adherent mutation that can cause it. And where are these located? So for intestinal gastric adenocarcinoma, it's usually on the lesser curvature of the stomach as an ulcer with heaped margins, which we've already seen. We've already seen those gastric ulcers in the past. Whereas in diffuse gastric adenocarcinoma, it's the name speaks for itself that, that there is diffuse stomach wall thickening. So we've seen this picture before. I just wanted to point out that that gastric ulcer that looks malignant, 
that's the intestinal type of gastric adenocarcinoma. And it's, you'll, you'll see it described as a poor, with poorly defined borders and heaped up margins. On the other hand, our linitis plastica, this diffuse stomach wall thickening, that looks like this on imaging. So here on a normal stomach, you can see how thin the wall is normally, very pencil thin. But if you look at the stomach on the right, you can see how thick the stomach is. And that's called linitis plastica, that's diffuse thickening. How they like to test both of these gastric adenocarcinomas, they want you to know some of the perineoplastic presentations for each of these. So either subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma can present with metastases to the liver. And when we talk in the liver section, I go over a section on liver metastases. And as you can see, the most common primary site of liver metastases is the GI tract. So if you see a picture and they show you this, you see a bunch of spots in the liver. I want the first thing I want you to think about is it's some sort of GI tract tumor, whether that's a gastric adenocarcinoma, colon cancer, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, you have to use your best judgment to find the exact primary, but it usually comes from the GI tract if you see liver mats. And now some of the perineoplastic presentations, you'll get this thing called the lesser tree lot sign, you can get something called acanthosis nigricans and the Verkau node. So let's go over each of these three presentations so you're aware of them on test day. The lesser tree lot sign is an onset of multiple seborrheic keratoses. So what, what are those? Seborrheic keratoses are these, uh, these darkened skin changes that you'll find. These can be normal in older age. I don't want you to think that anybody who has these has gastric cancer, because that's not true. But on a test, if you see somebody who comes in, they're having weight loss and early satiety, or they're just having this abdominal pain and they notice this, this new onset of these skin changes, your brain should be really considering gastric adenocarcinoma until proven otherwise. The next thing we should talk about is acanthosis nigricans. This is a hyperpigmentation in the body folds and skin creases. So it looks like this. You can see it on the neck and the armpits. And again, I don't want you to think somebody who has this has gastric adenocarcinoma because it's in addition to be being associated with tumors, it's associated with obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's a lot of things that are associated with this. But again, it could help you if they give you somebody especially somebody who's older or who has a risk factor and they're presenting in a way that sounds a little bit like cancer and then they show you this picture, then I really want you to think about gastric adenocarcinoma. And the third sign here we're gonna go over is the Verkau node. So the Verkau node is an enlarged left supraclavicular lymph node. And this suggests that the, the tumor has already spread from the primary gastric site into the left supraclavicular node. So here you can see this left supraclavicular node is enlarged. They usually won't give you a picture. They'll just tell you that it's enlarged on a test. And how I remember Verkau as the left supraclavicular, I like to remember Verkau and I put an O in front of it. So it's instead of Verkau node, I think of it as an Overkau node. And so when I see Overkau, I remember that the C stands for clavicle. So it's instead of Overkau, it's Overclavicle. I know that's kind of a complicated one, a mnemonic, but it, once you realize that mnemonic, I don't know, it's worked for me. So some of these mnemonics I hope you use, find useful. This one might not be as much, but this is it's helpful. So just know that the Verkau node is an enlarged supraclavicular lymph node, suggestive of gastric adenocarcinoma. So now let's talk about some perineoplastic presentations that are exclusive to either the intestinal subtype or the diffuse subtype. So the intestinal subtype can present with something called the Sister Mary Joseph nodule. And so what the Sister Mary Joseph nodule looks like is a subcutaneous periumbilical metastases. So you can see the subcutaneous metastases right here around the belly button. I like to remember this because I remember the Sister Mary Joseph, it's very religious. And I think about a cross and I know that the cross goes straight down midline through your umbilicus. So that's a way I remember it. And now diffuse gastric adenocarcinoma can present with linitis plastica, which we discussed already. And you'll see signet ring cells or Kruckenberg tumors. 
So let's go over what each of those are. So lineitis plastica just means that thickening of the stomach wall. Signet ring cells, which we haven't talked about yet, these are mucin-filled cells with peripheral nuclei. And the reason why the nuclei are pushed to the side is because there's so much mucus being produced by these malignant cells that the nuclei has no space in the middle anymore. It gets pushed to the side. And so you can see there's several signet ring cells here, but you can just see the ones I circled. And just so you have a depiction of a signet ring, that's kind of what a signet ring looks like. And the last thing we wanted to talk about was that Krukenberg tumor. Those are bilateral ovarian metastases. And if you biopsy either of those lesions, you're going to find signet ring cells there as well. And I want you to realize on test day, if they ever describe somebody with bilateral ovarian metastases, you should think about gastric adenocarcinoma. And they'll usually give it in the context of somebody who's also having a primary gastric cancer symptoms. So just keep that in mind. A couple lower yield things we're going to go over really quick is the gastro is gastroparesis. So how gastroparesis works is that you have uh, neuron damage and that prevents you from appropriately, um, from your body from using peristalsis appropriately. And so what's gonna happen is that food will just build up in your stomach instead. And so you can imagine the food's usually going around here, but in the case of gastroparesis, this whole cycle gets slowed down. And usually, why would you have this nerve damage causing this? Usually it is because of diabetes, chronic diabetes. We know diabetes can affect your nerves in several areas. That's why people usually have diabetic neuropathy. But over time, it can actually form uh, gastroparesis through some of the same mechanisms. Some medications can also blunt this your nerve response or cause nerve damage. And how it presents is you're going to get abdominal pain after eating, which makes sense because all that bolus of food you had isn't progressing normally through your GI tract. It's getting stuck in certain areas. So you can get nausea and vomiting too for that same reason. And you're usually going to be full quicker than you think because there's nothing else moving along because the food's just sitting in your stomach. Two treatments that we have for gastroparesis are somewhat important to know. You should know that metoclopramide is a dopamine antagonist, and that can help promote gastric emptying. But as with most dopamine antagonists, you have to worry about the side effects. So you can get Parkinson side effects. The whole disease of Parkinson's disease is a decrease in dopamine. So it makes sense that this may cause, the metoclopramide may cause Parkinsonian side effects. You can also get other central nervous system symptoms like seizures, depression, and drowsiness. And just remember that metoclopramide, you don't wanna use this if somebody has a small bowel obstruction because then you're just gonna be pushing more food into that obstruction and you can cause a perforation. Erythromycin on the other hand is a macrolide and how it works is it binds to motilin receptors to increase activity in the gut. And we talk about motilin receptors in the small intestine lecture. Okay, the next section we're gonna talk about is post-gastrectomy complications and dumping syndrome. So what is a gastrectomy? A gastrectomy is a surgical removal of either a portion of the stomach or the entire stomach. And it's usually elective due to obesity or you can maybe have to have a region removed because of a tumor. So complications, you can get pernicious anemia, as we've discussed before, and that's because you're losing intrinsic factor because you don't have any enough parietal cells. And you, people who have gastrectomies often receive B12 injections because they don't have a, a, enough um, intrinsic factor to absorb it by mouth. Another complication of gastrectomy is something called dumping syndrome. So we'll talk about that now. So dumping syndrome, how it works is that the stomach normally acts as a reservoir so that only small amount, uh, only small portions of food can get into the intestine at one time. So you have some food coming in and then little boluses can enter the duodenum and everything's fine. The problem is that if you don't have that big of a stomach, sometimes 
you can have large boluses enter the intestine at once. And so you can get a large bolus of food in the intestine. And what's the problem with that? Well, the problem, there's a few different problems. First off, because you have such a big bolus of uh, food or products in your intestine, it can actually draw water into the lumen. And what will happen is that if water comes into the lumen, you're going to have excessive diarrhea. You can also get abdominal pain and nausea from this. Another characteristic of dumping syndrome is that you'll get classically vasomotor symptoms. So you might have sweating, you might have palpitations, high heart rate. And why this is happening is because you're getting such rapidly decreasing intravascular volume. Because remember, all that water is just flowing into your GI tract through that osmotic gradient. And because of that, you can actually get these vasomotor symptoms as well. And so you need to treat this for people who have had a gastrectomy. A good way to treat this is to decrease your meal sizes and also decrease the amount of simple sugars because those simple sugars, it's easier for sugar to get inside your duodenum and cause this problem that we just talked about. All right, our last clinical condition is gonna be on pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis, the pathogenesis is you have hypertrophic pyloric musculature that causes a pyloric outlet obstruction. Okay, so normally here's our pylorus. You have food, you can open up, the food can get through. The problem is that if you have a hypertrophic pyloric musculature, there's no way for any of the food to actually get through and into your duodenum. So it gets stuck and sometimes it has to go back up. So this is gonna present with either a firstborn male with a failure to thrive. You might also see this classic non-bilious projectile vomiting between two to six weeks of age. I go into bilious versus non-bilious vomiting in the small intestine lecture, but just know that bile is secreted in the small intestine. So if, you're, if your bolus of food can't even make it to the small intestine, you're gonna get what's called non-bilious vomiting. This might present with an olive-shaped epigastric mass on test day. I've talked to, let me think, I've talked to at least three pediatricians and nobody's ever felt an olive-shaped epigastric mass before, but it's something to keep in mind. And you might see visible peristaltic waves as well. So how do you diagnose this? So you're gonna diagnose this. One way to do it, or to give you a, a higher clinical suspicion of pyloric stenosis, is you might see this classic hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis that we talked about earlier. And as a quick recap, you can see this in several diseases that involve severe vomiting. And what happens is that the hypokalemia is because you're losing so much volume, your kidneys try to save some of your volume by re reabsorbing sodium, but they do that at the expense of potassium. So you're gonna be hypokalemic. And then obviously the hypochloremia makes sense because you're losing chloride. The metabolic alkalosis should make sense because you're losing hydrogen at the expense of chloride. On ultrasound, you're gonna find a thickened pylorus. So here's an ultrasound and I, I'm just gonna highlight one part of the wall. You can see the other part below, but it's a very thick pylorus. And how do you treat this? So this is where they get you on test day. You need to correct the electrolyte abnormalities first, okay? Once you've done that, then you can surgically correct it with a pyloromyotomy. I really wanna emphasize this because I missed a question before on this. It's very tempting to just put pyloromyotomy, but if, if somebody's extremely hypokalemic, you cannot safely take them to surgery yet. You should get that corrected. And then once that's corrected, then you can proceed with the surgery. I believe that is all for this lecture. So thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on the small intestine lecture. Thank you.